Hello there. My name is Corey, if this is your first time here, and we are reading through the Bible this year. So this is the 10 minute recap of all the chapters that we were assigned to read this week. And those chapters are Deuteronomy 15 to Joshua 8. So if you would like to learn more about our reading program, then hop on over to our website at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. There's also a ton of resources over there to help you dig deeper into the Bible. Now, last thing, if you've been watching my videos and haven't subscribed yet, then please do. It really helps the channel to grow. Okay, here we go. Deuteronomy 15, it outlines the year for canceling debts and freeing servants. So these were very similar concepts in Israel because if you were deeply in debt or faced financial ruin, and so we're naturally then facing the prospect of starvation, you could sell yourself into debt slavery to earn a living. Uh, so this was to be a very temporary measure. Every seventh year, debts and servitude would be canceled. The chapter also talks about the firstborn male of all flocks and herds uh, needed to be offered to God in a fellowship offering, so a celebratory meal, and this was to commemorate God's faithfulness in providing. Deuteronomy chapter 16 goes over the instructions for the yearly festivals that were to see the people travel to the central place of worship, uh, which of course would become Jerusalem in later years. So the feasts of Passover and unleavened bread, celebrating the Exodus, the feast of weeks or Pentecost, celebrating the wheat harvest and God's provision, and then the feast of tabernacles, celebrating the fall fruit harvest. The chapter also mentions that each town in Israel should have judges and officials appointed to administer justice. Now, these were not allowed to bow to bribery or partiality. Deuteronomy 17 outlines what constitutes as idolatry, which was actually a capital offense, and it gives the rules for capital punishment, which required three credible witnesses to establish someone's guilt. The law courts of Israel were to be those appointed officials and judges in each city, and then they could appeal to the priests and judge that would live where the tabernacle was set up and later the temple, and they would have that final say in ruling. Deuteronomy 17 also gives rules for future kings of Israel that had to do with trusting God. So the rules seem to limit the physical safety nets in order to prioritize trust in God. Kings were to write a copy of the law for themselves and read it daily. They weren't supposed to trust in horses, marriages, which would have represented military alliances, nor large amounts of wealth. Okay, then Deuteronomy chapter 18 outlines, sorry, the portions of Israel's offerings to God that would go to the priests and Levites. So it reinforces that occult-like practices of pagan nations are completely outlawed for Israel, lest they become like those nations and likewise come under the judgment of God. And the chapter lets them know that they will hear God's word through his prophets. They don't have to go into divination. And the prophets will be trustworthy in their predictive prophecy and their messages. Deuteronomy chapter 19 deals with the cities of refuge and this concept of how spilling human blood actually polluted the land. So how was Israel supposed to deal with it? It was outlined there. Deuteronomy chapter 20 talks about how Israel was to engage in war. The priests of God were to go into battle with Israel, and there were exemptions to get men out of military service. Basically, if there were blessings of the promised land that they hadn't yet experienced. So if they had just built a house, if they had just planted a vineyard, or if they were pledged to be married, or even if they were just very scared, they were allowed out of service. There are also rules for regular warfare here, including how to make peace with people, and then rules for the conquest of Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 21 discusses what Israel was to do in the case of an unsolved murder, so how they could still make atonement for that spilled human blood. It gives rules for how to treat women who had become captives in warfare. So the bottom line here is that Israelites had to treat these women like Israelite women and marry them as full wives if they were to have relationships with them at all. The rest of the chapter deals with inheritance laws and how fathers were not to decide inheritances based on preference. 
Deuteronomy chapter 22 contains various cultural laws for living, like helping missing or endangered animals, even if they belong to your enemy. Also, not mixing categories like men and women's clothing, different seeds in a field or different materials in clothing, and a whole host of what ifs when it came to marriage violations. Deuteronomy chapter 23 then outlines things that would exclude a person from standing in the formal assembly of Israel before God. Uh, castration, being the product or being in a forbidden marriage, being an Ammonite or Moabite because of their history with Israel, or being a first or second generation Edomite or an Egyptian. Now, this chapter also talks about how to keep the camp of Israel from ritual defilement and some miscellaneous laws like providing refuge to runaway slaves, not charging Israelites interest on loans, and fulfilling vows to God. Deuteronomy 24 continues these various laws, like divorce being final, not requiring military service from a just married man, capital punishment for kidnappers and slave traders, and not taking life necessities from people in pledge for outstanding payments. Deuteronomy 25 continues these laws with more of a focus on inheritance. It outlines leveret or brother marriage. So that would provide a child to a childless widow in order to provide physically for her future by the child inheriting the dead husband's estate. So for a brother to refuse to provide for his dead brother's widow in this way was seen as a shame upon his family, and he would become known as the unsandaled. Deuteronomy 26 talks about first fruit offerings and tithes to God. These tithes were to, to be presented to God in the tabernacle and later temple. They were to be eaten and shared by the family and the priests and the foreigners and needy among the people. And every third year, the entire tithe was to be given to the disadvantaged in the people's own towns so that they could feast and celebrate. Deuteronomy 27 outlines the covenant ceremony that was to take place at the city of Shechem and the two hills that flanked it. So once the Israelites took the promised land over, this was supposed to happen. An altar was to be built on Mount Ebal. Some of the tribes were to stand on Mount Ebal and the other tribes on Mount Gerizim. And the Levites would pronounce curses for disobeying God. Deuteronomy 28 records the blessings that would follow Israel for obedience, and again, the curses that would follow if they disobeyed the covenant. Deuteronomy 29 begins a covenant renewal between God and the Israelites that happened before they began the conquest. So this is while they're camping in Moab, and Moses mediates this covenant. Deuteronomy 30 continues the covenant ceremony by setting out the terms. So Israel now knew the rules, they knew the mistakes, they, knew, they now just had to choose how they were going to live. Deuteronomy 31 sees Joshua receiving the leadership of Israel from Moses, and there's a record of Moses writing down the law and telling the priests to read it to Israel every seven years. God also tells Moses and Joshua about Israel's future rebellion against him. Deuteronomy 32 records the Song of Moses, which really revolves around the themes of Israel's rebellion and God's mercy. Deuteronomy 33 records the blessings that Moses gave to each of the tribes of Israel. And Deuteronomy 34 closes out the book by recording the death of Moses at 120 years old. Now on to the first eight chapters of Joshua. In Joshua 1, Joshua gets orders from God to be strong and courageous and to know and follow the law. He is promised that God will be with him, and Joshua prepares the people to cross the Jordan River and begin the conquest. Joshua 2 has Joshua sending two spies into Jericho, and we get the history of Rahab, a prostitute from Jericho, who allies herself with Israel and secures her and her family's safety. Joshua 3 has Israel crossing the Jordan River, and there's the miracle of the Jordan River going dry for Israel to cross it. Joshua told Israel in advance that the waters would stop, so this miracle was confirmation of him as leader and prophet of Israel. In Joshua 4, the Israelites set up a 12-stone memorial to commemorate the Jordan River crossing, and we're told that when the priests leave the river, the water began to flow back. Joshua 5 records Joshua circumcising the men of Israel. The scriptures actually say circumcise the men again. Now, either the men had not been circumcised as boys in order to wait for this moment, or perhaps they had been circumcised in an Egyptian style, which wasn't a full circumcision, and so it might have required re-circumcision, but that's just a theory. 
The Israelites celebrate the first Passover in the Promised Land, and there's a quick mention of Joshua meeting the commander of the Lord's army. Joshua 6 sees the famous sacking of the very fortified city of Jericho, God, of course, causing the walls of the city to fall and allowing Israel to take it. In Joshua 7, God punishes Achan for stealing some plunder from Jericho. And finally, Joshua 8 records the destruction of the city of Ai, after which Israel travels to Shechem and completes that covenant ceremony that was instructed to them back in Deuteronomy 27. So that's all for this week. Happy studying. I'll see you next time. Thank you so much for watching. We want to keep producing high quality biblical content, but we can't do it without your support. If you feel called to support us, please click the link in the description under donate. Your support really means a lot to us.